started with Kevin McDonald, whose brother I had shared an office with. It's funny, we had shared the same office for a couple of years, probably longer, whilst I was having the most miserable time trying to make that movie and doing a terrible job of it. His brother had been making train spotting. So I'd been sitting there, like, not doing anything at all, while the guy sitting opposite me happens to be making, like, the seminal movie of the British film industry for an entire decade. And so I just had to watch this guy sort of rising to glory as I was just floundering in the corner not knowing what I was doing. One day in September was the first idea I had and I discussed it with him and he was interested so he said he'd do it and he wrote a treatment. Then we, the company I was with, Passion in the early days, paid for him and me to go to Israel to meet all the people and to do a bit of research. And we did and, you know, we decided there was definitely a film to be made and a story to be told. And uh, Kevin had a good relationship with the BBC, so we went to the BBC and they said they'd invest and, you know, slowly we put the pieces of the puzzle together. And I found this American company, Julie Goldman, who produced Buck. It was, she was working there at the time. They were called non-fiction films and they were going to finance the rest of the film. And in fact, we only went to Israel when they said, yes, we'll finance the rest of the film. And we went to Israel, had our trip, spent our money, which we didn't really have, came back to be told by them, actually, we won't finance your film. And a British producer called Sandy Lieberson, who, uh, who produced um, that famous Donald Camel film with uh, Mick Jagger. Performance, was it called? He, anyway, he was an indie British producer, much older than me. I'd rung him for some advice, and he said, you should call this man Arthur Cohen. He's a documentary specialist, and, and uh, you know, maybe he'd be interested. So he gave me his number and I rang him completely out of the blue in his office in Basel and this very gruff voice just said, he basically said, I don't do documentaries, I'm not interested, but what's it about? And I said, you know, what it was about. And he said, oh well, fax me the treatment, but I'm not going to do it, I'm not interested. And literally 36 hours later I met with him, he flew to London, I met with him at the uh, Inn on the Park, at the bottom of Park Lane. And I should have known, actually. I mean, it was really, really, it was incredibly exciting for me because Arthur was one of the producers of a film called The Garden of the Fincy Contini's, which is a Vittorio De Sica film. Well. Yeah, which he won Oscar number 200 for. And uh, it's a beautiful, amazing film. And my father, who was a big film buff, he used to love watching films, still does, had made me watch it with him. I'd watched it with him many times. It's a fantastic film, so I was so excited to meet this producer. And... Um, we sat down and we had a quite peculiar meeting, but he was great, he was sort of inspirational. And, but the first thing he said to me was, he said, will you have lots of archive in the film? And I was like, well, I don't know, I hope so. He said, but will you have archive? And we talked about the things, will you have archive? Will there be enough archive? Will you have archive? Will there be archive? And, 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 then, and then eventually he said, will you have archive? Because if you don't, you won't win the Oscar. And I was thinking, this is the first conversation. We haven't even begun to make a film that we think we might make, and I don't know what's going to be in it, I don't know how we're going to make it, but already this man is thinking, how the hell are we going to win an Oscar? I remember very clearly there was a moment where we got in a bunch of archive from ABC in America, which is that man in the yellow jacket, is basically ABC. And I remember being in my office and watching this tape, this VHS tape came in, and on it was the moment when Jim Mackay turns to the camera and tells everyone what's really happened. And if you haven't seen the film, there's a sort of toing and froing through live television. At a certain point, they're told that everyone's saved. And so in the studio, they're broadcasting and they're like, oh, it's great, it's all good, everyone's safe, isn't it? Fabulous. And a spokesman comes in for the Olympics and says, you know, we're so pleased that, that actually everything's gone off well and isn't it a relief and now we can get on with the games. And then I don't know how long later, two, an hour and a half later, there's you know, no, at a certain point, he, Jim Mackay says, I'm now we're not so sure that, there was, that, that the reports we've had were right, maybe they were too optimistic. Then at a certain point, he turns to the camera and says, he says, it's amazing that him and two other guys who've been talking about it live on TV, and he says, you know, my father said your worst nightmares and your greatest dreams are never realized. And tonight, our worst night nightmares have been realized. And I remember watching this piece of archive, and literally, it's almost happening now the hair standing up on the back of my neck as I saw this amazing moment where you can see he's just this side of completely breaking down. He's been broadcasting the whole way through, so he's exhausted. And he says, they're all gone. And it's really powerful. And I watched that and I thought, shit, we have definitely got a film. <laughs> it was an idea I had reading an article in the Times in England when I saw that Pat had 
he left his contract as a professional footballer to join the army. I saw that story and I thought, wow, that's for an American to do that. It's like the American dream to be an American footballer. To give that up, to go to fight in the war seemed like an amazing thing. And I just saw that. And then subsequently I read the next story, which was that he'd been killed. And because I'm a sort of conspiracy theory hysteric, I immediately thought, I don't believe what I just read. I just don't believe that what I just read is really what happened. And sure enough, it wasn't what happened. And I immediately thought, I want to look into that. And uh, I spoke to Amir Barlev, who I'd made this film, My Kid Could Paint That With, and he was very keen. And, and the guys who part financed, or who bought My Kid Could Paint That, A&E, run by Molly Thompson, we pitched it to her, and they were just, she was just in, in a heartbeat, basically. She gave us a chunk of development money. And we, it was another one of those, and again, this is, I think, one of the sort of exciting things about what we do, is that I called Pat's, wife, Marie Tillman, out of the blue, never spoken to her in my life. I got her number from someone who had worked with her and just called her out of the blue and, ha and started the process of trying to talk her into making, allowing us to make a documentary. Many people had approached the family to make movies, documentaries, they turned everyone down. And, and she agreed to meet with us in New York, so I flew to New York, met Amir, and we met with her there. And then I got her to agree to allow Amir and I to go out to LA where she lived and spend two weeks there. And we'd, we said we'd sort of workshop it with her. We'd have a bunch of meetings with her, talk through what we thought we wanted, listen to what, what she thought she might want if she, if she wanted anything at all. And so this process began, and it's a difficult process because it's basically manipulation on my part. I'm trying to talk someone into something that I know they don't want to be talked into, and that's not an easy thing. I mean, it is an easy thing to do, I'm afraid, rather worryingly, but it's not a comfortable thing to do. Because, because what happened, and it, it sort of continued to happen through the whole process, is we both, but I kind of fell in love with all of them, this whole family is just so extraordinary. And so we became really good friends with Marie really quickly. And, and as, the, as this, these two weeks unfolded, I could sort of sense probably more and more that she was getting more and more keen to do the film with us. And of course, and I was sort of feeling, obviously I wanted to make the film really badly, but I started to understand just what was at stake for, this, for her because she's such a remarkable person and because because she had dealt with what happened to her husband in a very specific way, and it was a way that was very deliberate, very well thought out, and it was the exact opposite way that you would maybe expect, which was just to be incredibly dignified, incredibly honest with herself, and to stay away from anything and everyone who wanted a bit of her. No press, no this, she just wanted to stay away from it. And so I sort of was in this position where we were talking a woman into doing something with us that was inevitably going to pull her into a situation that she very brilliantly made sure she wasn't part of. Of course, we backed ourselves as filmmakers to do it in the way they wanted it done. So, so that was, you know, I never thought we were going to deceive her. But at the same time, what I do know from making documentaries is when you make documentaries about real people, which of course they all are, the finished product is never what they think it's going to be. I'd never produced anything, obviously. I, I, I mailed it out to a whole bunch of film finances around the world with a letter from me that said, you may remember we met at Cannes, at the Cannes Film Festival with, and then I put two names of really famous people who I knew in the film business. Now, I'd never met any of the people I was sending the script to, but I knew if they read me saying, you, you remember we met at Cannes with this person and that person, they'd think, shit, I must have met that guy, because if it was with that person and that person, he must be someone who is someone, and they'd take my script seriously. And the reason that I, I give that as an example is, is what I was gonna say is, you know, not having 10 years of, experience, uh, of hanging out with those sort of people, I think you need to have some guts about you, you know? When you find yourself in a room and, you, and there's someone over there who you know is important, who maybe can, you need to just march up to them and be polite, but just, just be, a, you know, be, be, have the courage of your convictions to approach someone and, you, and just chat with them as best you can, you know? And, and I think that, uh, and actually what, I, what I've learned through my career is that there are moments, even today, when I, if I've got a phone call to make or a meeting to have that's gonna be really difficult, really awkward, that I kind of rather not have, or a call I'd rather, those are the moments I really look forward to, because those are the moments that I force myself to do what you gotta do 
you know, make that call, have that meeting. But when I could so easily either get someone else to do it for me or like, you know, make up some reason why I'm delaying it. But I, 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 I sort of, I welcome that moment where I've got that horrible call to make because I, I go about it with sort of double energy. And I think that, um, you know, I suppose you have to put yourself out there. 